make you feel kind we're gonna have a good time let's get the meaning down we're gonna spread being nice around you just go right ahead because it's here and it's now just move every bone to a cosmic powwow cosmic powwow cosmic powwow hello to everyone out there thank you so much for tuning in it's a pleasure to be here with you again this is the show which talks about many things that are so important for us all to have a better quality of life and the show which at the current time and for some previous sessions has continued to ask you to call in with your response to what are you living for and is it even worth examining what you're living for in this context one person had said to me that question is too scary to ask so I hope we get some responses about that this evening now before we start on the main gist of the show I'd like to make a few comments a couple of comments on on themes that I bring up over and over again because they are so urgent because necessity is the mother of invention and in our history in this country and around the world change does not happen until cataclysms occur and we are in the process of cataclysm but because we still have more or less the life we are used to we're not aware of how urgent it is for us to act one of the cataclysmic events occurring is environmental damage and I'm sending again a plea for people to listen watch and and be observant of the environment around them last weekend here in Boston which was a weekend in February we had a a very uh, suddenly very um, mild spring-like day that hit 70 degrees after which followed a day that shot back down to the 30s this is not normal this is only no becoming normal for a very recent period this is only so-called normal per uh, recent history for for all the aberrances that are happening in the environment and it's a sure cue that something is terribly amiss we are, we've been lucky in this period to have several sunny days which is also not um, as frequent and consistent an occurrence by any means as it used to be in the relatively recent past of 20, 25, 30 years ago. We need sunny days. Sunny days are even tied to our health and welfare. But all these things we need because the earth is life itself. The earth is the thing that is worthy of our reverence. The earth is our life force. It's, 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 it's the breathing being of what we are so let us be more aware of how exponentially mathematically as things get ruined more smoggy more dirty more dry more acid everything is irre irretrievably and irreversibly becoming damaged dead and it will come back at us as it is in such strange weather including a lot of the flooding earthquakes and this specific that I mentioned to you of wild temperature variations and and uh, volatile weather patterns the second point I wanted to make is for our environment is how terribly sad that we are poisoning with our pesticides and every other toxin that we engineer produce and use I saw uh, again pictures of agriculture being sprayed with the big spraying machines imagine those poisons that are being sprayed onto the lettuce onto the peppers onto everything you eat are going into the vegetables and fruit they cannot be washed out so imagine you are you are uh, getting these poisons in those foods 
So please be aware that the food is being poisoned, the spraying goes on, the coloring materials go on to the food, the preserving materials go on to the food, and it doesn't wash out. It's in the food, it's in you, it's part per million, parts per million and billion coming into you all the time in every way. And then I saw a little piece on, on the little bugs that we used to call ladybugs with the little uh, shell back that are yellow and red with the dots. They're, they're called ladybirds, actually. And they uh, eat aphids, and aphids eat plants. The aphids uh, eat plants that we need to survive. So the ladybird, or what is conventionally called the ladybug, eats these and keeps them in control. But when we spray things, all the ladybird insects die as well. And, and so they can only live in places where there's no spraying going on. And what a sad thing that the balance of life that's so beautiful and cute and normal and right is, is, is getting thrown out of whack and destroyed this way. Also, pesticides kill the birds, they sicken pets. Uh, how about things you have on your lawn that you use for weeding and so on? Uh, it's unconscionable. And uh, don't forget, smaller animals would be far more susceptible to the parts per million, as would babies, than are we adults. When a conference was held, I believe it was last year, a world conference on the environment, the U.S. was said to be the biggest offender. And I saw a program uh, here recently saying how this is fallacious, that we're not really ru ruining the environment. But we do, by far, consume the most oil and manufacture the most toxins and emissions into the water and air. And this may well come back to bite us. It's a mathematical proposition. Things add up, and they add up to unhealthy, and worse than that, dying life. We also mention animals, and um, I was just thinking, too, and seeing some video again recently of monkeys with their young, you know, picking their young up, clutching them, carrying them around, watching them, making sure they're safe. Think that we would take uh, drills and drill in the skulls of such animals and keep them in, in cages in the laboratory and shoot them into space with electrodes in their head. Think about that. Really look at animals and see how sentient, that is to say, feeling, experiencing, and alive they are, and knowledgeable as well. And, and imagine that we are doing such horrible, horrible crimes to animals. Or think of the, the cat in New York that went into a burning building, a mother cat, and saved all her kittens, or many of them, and herself was singed brutally uh, in the process. Uh, animals are so precious. Please let us not experiment on them and let us love them. And let us watch them to see how amazing and rightful they are for, uh, for, for being part of this earth. Now, again, we, now we will, last time many questions came in um, regarding aspects of psychology. So I'm going to say some things in that regard this time. And uh, before we do, I'd like to repeat one of the basic questions we have continued to ask, which is, what are you living for? And is it even worth examining what you are living for? Now, I use the word environment a lot when I'm speaking of things about our cultural engineering, our quality of life, our behavior, our psychology. And I use the word environment, of course, when I talk about the weather, the volatility of the weather, the toxins polluting the air and the water. So I wanted to be sure that I made a distinction between two kinds of environment, one being the common usage so, so popular today of environment being our nature and what is or isn't happening to it. The second environment is the environment of our psychology, the environment of the room that I'm in right now, the mood of the people that are in the room with me, their feelings about what they're doing, my knowledge that you're out there watching, my attention to what I have to say, my awareness of noises in the background, my slight uh, disorientation and discrepancy because of that, uh, w whether I'm hungry or not, uh, 
how I'm generally feeling health-wise, what kind of stresses I may or may not have going on in my life, what is before me when I conclude this show, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are my environment, and they are properly my psychological environment, so to speak, which can range from anything that is literally tangible to measurable, such as the humidity of the air, to whether there is sunshine outside, to the number of to the number of things around you, the kinds of the quality, the kinds of things around you, whether you're in a city with concrete under your feet and tall buildings, or in a rural setting with space and a couple of birds singing, and uh, what interpersonally goes on between myself and yourself and other people and its effects. So that is the meaning we give to environment in psychology or behaviorism or the study of human behavior. And in being here and talking about all these issues and making it not just psychology but philosophy as in what are you living for and uh, environment and economy as we have mentioned and practical issues of how we are or are not living together, we are, we are trying to bring forth a, an awareness and a motive to engineer our culture, to engineer our coexistence, to engineer our society of how we live individually and how we live as a group because we do not have to have a situation where violence is the rule of the day, fear is the rule of the day, uh, animosity and degradation and enemy or, or strangeness, alienation from your fellow human being is the rule of the day, increasing depression is the rule of the day. We do not have to have this. We do not have to sit idly by with our commercial experience, with our commercial conditionings that uh, promote us to react as one-dimensional people, sort of just consumers, rather than human beings. We do not have to live in that one-dimensional world. We have brains, we have minds, we have bodies, we have thoughts, and we can do things to engineer our existence to completely go in another direction altogether. This is a very... Uh, uh, intricate and and uh, broad kind of undertaking. Um, now, I wanted to mention too, in thinking about any of these things or about each other or what we might want out of life, we should be be concerned always, as I have mentioned previously, that there are many sides to everything we're hearing and thinking about and to try to not be caught in rigid patterns of seeing or, or reacting basically only on feeling or seeing something from just a narrow point of view and being prone towards those arguments and opinions that fit one's own and close to those that don't. Or, or worse yet, uh, satisfying oneself with, with arguments that soothe the psyche, that soothe uh, one's distress, that make one feel better. And instead, we have to harshly look at reality. We have to strip the truth to its naked reality. And when we do that, a lot of the things we will see do not feel good. It's a struggle. They won't fit. And just in the fact, even though they may not be big things to be thinking about, due to the fact that they don't fit, there will be uh, a kind of dissonance, a kind of unease set up in us where we will tend to withdraw from harsh, objective truths. So life doesn't move according to the needs and wants that we, that we have, and it doesn't move according to us fixing things and putting them together so that they make sense that will make us feel better or give us a rhyme and a reason that doesn't in the broad, harsh light of reality, stand up to, to fact and just being what it is is what it is. Okay, in this respect, uh, as human beings, we have several mechanisms of defense, so to speak, in our thinking and feeling patterns. And these were first properly pointed out by Sigmund Freud, 
uh, with whom most of you probably are familiar, at least in name. Uh, he's probably often said his name might be remarked about disparagingly, too, uh, with giddy comments, because a lot of what he spoke about was the fundamental issue of sex in the life of human beings at a time when that was highly taboo, unlike today, although we still giggle about such topics. And um, hence, in, in general, in the culture, his name is often paired with uh, kind of joking um, um, references. But Freud pointed out several mechanisms that we, we tend to have in our mutual pathology, if you will, our mutual survivalism, our psychological survivalism in dealing with uh, becoming socialized into the human race, in dealing with having to curtail our own needs and wants and to fit into a culture that has a role for us to play, obey our parents or obey authorities, or in dealing with things that we cannot tolerate uh, because they struck us as traumatic events as we were growing, simple things, and not, not necessarily some of such major things that we hear about so much today, but simple things that when one is a child, uh, cut, cut one like a knife. Uh, the, the words can have very uh, devastating impact uh, on even when you're an adult or actions where, for example, one might feel that one's sibling is treated with more fairness. This is a very devastating and cutting thing to uh, a growing human being. Now some of these mechanisms of defense are rationalization where we um, use we, we make up good excuses for why we think or act as we do. Like if we have uh, some work to do and we're procrastinating, we might say, well, uh, it's not really that important work to do, or nobody will notice if it's not there, or I did enough, more properly would be something like, I did enough uh, last week, I don't have to do so much this week. We, we play games, our mind automatically starts to think of things to help us not just deal with, for example, that we're not doing something we feel we should be doing, so we kind of make up excuses, or if we go off a diet, that, or we take a cigarette and we don't want to be smoking, we, we have, well, it's only one, and these are rationalizations. We also have displacement, where we put our aggression and anger, uh, that stress and frustration, on to people we come into contact with, the classic being, as many sitcoms have shown, the, the customer in a restaurant putting it on to a waiter or a waitress. Displacement. And we typically would do that with people that we're not so threatened by, who cannot uh, stand up and physically uh, re re retaliate to us or even just have no authority over us. Uh, even classically in some abuse cases where it's the female that's been abused, for example, perhaps a male uh, may come in and displace aggression on a female at home where he was um, able to do it with with impunity would be an example, and perhaps the opposite could exist. And we all know of situations, too, where then it's, it's been pointed out how females would have their way of getting at the male in, an, in another way, maybe by sending jabs or having, in, in a roundabout way, getting at the male to, to, to get that, the wife's position in, the wife's uh, animosity, the wife's hostility, but not so uh, directly and unreservedly as just displacing aggression right onto the male, but in other roundabout ways. Now, we also have uh, projection, which is putting one's feelings onto somebody else so that you make the next guy the evildoer, the next guy the responsible person, and ha ha tend to have no feeling of fault yourself. That's another game that our mind can play with us oftentimes without our realizing it, and many, many others that I won't enumerate right now, but you, you get the idea that our mind is capable of playing so many kinds of uh, games on us, 
uh, many of them us being just into patterns of behavior that we're not all that aware of and we're not in the habit of even looking into or being attuned to it and since we're mentioning that let's mention psychology because psychology is just that psychology is being attuned to what how when where if and and as we are as human beings everything we do as behaving living human beings <clears throat> so and to sum up this previous uh, um, um, information we are imperfect beings and uh, we are blinded by our reactions by the things we have inside of us that have been too painful to handle or that we've had to curtail in order to keep moving along and life is a struggle life is a work in progress and it's with our thinking even though thinking is combined with emotion and it's hard to sort the two out so often and and emotion will often um, basically precedes thinking but to become objective in thinking this is where our true uh, key to improving and graduating to higher order being lies in the use of our brain in the struggle to get towards objective and unadulterated truth it's harsh it's uncomfortable it, it leads to things that even even are simple they're not major things that are like hot buttons in the society they're simple but because they are maybe different in the way we're used to reacting they lead to great discomfort in us and we tend to avoid them but that is our challenge if we're going to evolve any further a case could be made that we are rather devolving these days than evolving because to evolving we would be relating even more we would be less violent we would be together more we would have more friendly feeling more peaceable feeling and these things seem to be narrowing so a case could be made for the fact that we are devolving instead of evolving and no amount of science technology industry trips to other planets cloning can ever change our basic human task which has been with us for as far as we know human history to become better human beings to become something better than barbaric to move to a nobler plane and to move ultimately to brotherly love to come communality now a lot of times when we t talk psychology or we mention that word uh, there's a stigma attached to it there is even a stigma attached to it among sciences other than psychology among medicine oftentimes among many disciplines um, and the stigma is many fold one of one of the parts of it I believe uh, stems from people being very uncomfortable with looking in the mirror or having the camera put on their own behavior by themselves or by someone else we just don't tend to want to observe ourselves we're much more you know as these mechanisms of defense I just pointed out would would illustrate we're much more um, complacent and unruffled to find a way to cope with whatever it is and keep going and I understand that there's a survivalism in that but even on minor parts of who we are and why we do what we do there's um, a, a great reluctance to be delving into what we are and that's what psychology is all about psychology also is not about so-called abnormality that's another sense I think people have when they hear psychology that oh something will be found out that's pathological about me or that it only deals with so-called abnormality it does not psychology deals with so much more it deals with perception and your physiology and your psychophysiology 
and your uh, senses and your learning and your memory and your motivation and your arousal systems and stress and your, your capacity to learn and your uh, different talents that you have as a human being, your conditioning, your habit formation. It goes on and on and on. It's the science from so many angles, like facets of a fabulous gem that tell you and put a mirror to and observe and study and systematize what makes people do what they do so that they can understand better what they're really doing and hopefully towards a goal to alleviate the hurt and the pain and the trials and tribulations that we put each other through. Yes, we have a young person here, Jasmine. Hello, Jasmine. Hello. She's with us this evening. Say hello to the people. Yes. Hello. She hurt her foot. How did you hurt your foot? Well, um, I was eating, you know, and I didn't want to finish because there was too much. And then when I got up, I slipped out of my hand and fell on my toe. Oh, so it must have been something heavy. Was What was it that you were eating? Um, beans and rice and... Um, was it enough to hurt your toe? Wow. That's it. Sometimes it's just the way it falls. It hits it just a certain way. And there you have it, right? We can't, you can't hear anything she's saying. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you for coming up here and bringing this question. And I want everyone to see an example of such a lovely child. Thank you very much, Jasmine. You're welcome. I don't know if our, get, if our people, viewers, could hear her, but she was saying she dropped something on her foot, and the way it fell, it hurt her foot last night. It was some of the food that she was eating. Okay. Now, she's helping us tonight, and her lovely mother is our floor director this evening as well. So it's, it's a pleasure to see such lovely children, and children, it is very possible for children to be so well-mannered and 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 lovely. Now, now we have a question from Tim on Beacon Hill. Is society breaking down because we spend too much time with work instead of socializing? Well, the, the thought that comes to mind is we do not live by bread alone. And when we're at work, we are not relating today a lot. I know there are politics in the office and there are camaraderies and competitions that go on with people. For many people, work is a place they'd rather not go, unfortunately. And your mind, you should have time for work, and you should have time for play, and you should have time for leisure, and time for relaxation, and especially time for talking to people for no reason but to talk to them. Sort of like what we did in the tradition when we had lunches and breakfasts and dinners together, and people relaxed and related with each other. So yes, we are working too much and not playing, and we, and we are working many hours oftentimes, and we're on the road, and our work is so intensive uh, mentally and oftentimes so dissimilar from the people who are close to us that when we do come together, say, in the evening, we might be in separate universes and there's a great bridge. We might, that's why relationships even start at the office. A, because so much time is spent there, and B, because people might have more in common with their co-workers than ultimately they would have with a spouse. Um, also, I would like to point out that right now in Washington, there's a movement to make the retirement age even older than it is currently in order to receive social, social security. And uh, we're already worked to the bone in this country. I know a lot of us have bad attitudes about working, 
and many of us make it a point to work as little as possible. But if you really look hard, whether people want to or not, and even if they're trying to not work, and please don't congratulate yourself if that's what you're doing, but we are working ourselves to exhaustion by and large. Think of someone who is a checkout person at a major supermarket who also might be attending college as he or she often is, doing all that exhausting non-stop checking out of people in long lines and then expecting uh, and then having to go and also be in college and not get enough sleep, not get enough income and so on. So we are spending a lot of time at work we are on a certain wavelength when we are at work. Those are not natural, relaxing, interpersonal, uh, necessarily convivial and most satisfying kind of relationship, though once in a while they may be. They do pull families apart because works are each different from the other, and they lead to people being preoccupied and therefore rendered asunder. And also, uh, we, we did have more of a glue of society when people worked together, worked on the farm, all went out to the same place, went there without laziness, but went there at a pace that was more natural. Maybe technically worked longer hours per se, but worked at a certain pace, had some lunch. Uh, even, you know, I was even impressed, for example, with uh, something I saw about Vietnam. I saw not too long ago some farmers in the rice paddies who work long, long hours and, and carry heavy loads and go long distances, but they could smile. In spite of their circumstance, they had beautiful natural smile, which us, if we had that task ahead of us in those days, we'd be so miserable and our faces are set in frowns. They had camaraderie, they had presence of community, and they had a, a different sense of work than this hectic pace. Hectic pace, so I would say yes to Tim on Beacon Hill and to everyone, we should be socializing and not on the basis of, of who, who we know or what will network us regarding our jobs. That's, that's not a good reason. The reason is to talk to anybody and everybody for no reason at all, to talk to your brother and sister. Yes, we have another question. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's an unusual question. Um, I cannot read the person's name, I believe, Bob, yes. Bob from Brighton is asking, is panic disorder caused by toxins in food? Now, I don't know if there's something you might have read that might have led you to ask such a question or were you just thinking that. Um, in, in this world, you never know what could be causing what. So it's not out of the question that some foods we, we, or some things that we ingest could be causing a negative reaction in our bodies. But uh, the, the thing that we could be ingesting that comes to my mind might be stimulants um, such as coffees and teas, um, um, any, any kind of chemicals any kind of chemicals that um, cause us to be aroused would be exacerbating panic disorder. Um, also, there may be some medications we are taking for things other than panic disorder that could lead to a rapid heartbeat or a rapid pulse, uh, sweating, uh, uh, and many of the symptoms that would go along with panic disorder. Uh, for example, um, an anti-asthma medication might have this effect. So you, you could be getting exacerbation, but technically speaking, um, as we treat it and know it now, a panic disorder is um, a reaction that is triggered by physiological changes in your body due to states that you are going through and um, circumstances and contingencies, a word we've often used on previous programs, contingencies that are somehow triggering it with you knowing it or without you knowing it, or thoughts or feelings, emotions that are coming through you, uh, causing you to, to be in a state of panic. After all, panic is like fear. Panic is like fear. It's like having um, the things we experience in a fear reaction. Yes, we have another question, please. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah. Here's some Kleenex because I'm also perspiring under the hot lights. We have Luke from Back Bay who is asking, what do I think about cloning? Um, well, as I said before, um, no science will ever save us from our ultimate task. We may reach that task. I wouldn't be the person to know if we could reach the epitome of where we could be going into evolution of brotherhood and communality and true love towards one, toward one's fellow human being. So cloning, cloning cannot help that. The task of becoming less barbaric and less brutal and less nasty human being is ours and ours alone. And as the saying goes, every person must carry his or her own weight. So cloning won't help the ultimate human task that we cannot avoid ultimately, number one. Um, I'm trying to think what else do I think of cloning. I think that any experimentation on animal or humans changing the nature, playing God as the saying goes, is not correct, period. Uh, if you were doing such a thing in your home, if you were using animals and and extirpating tissue and playing with their genes and had a lab set up where you, where you did these procedures on them, you most likely would be taken away and charged. So the, the motivation for playing around with living beings and manipulating them, um, I, do not, I do not believe in. I, I feel very badly about it, in fact. I am opposed to it. Nature is so beautiful and balanced and harmonious and glorious the way it is. Uh, that, that is not our task. And also the drive behind a lot of experimentation and science, which is so-called knowledge, is to avoid death. If you really think about it, it's to prolong life and to have this race that will make men more mortal, that you can live longer, one more year, one more day. When you're ready to expire, we can still make you breathe. Your life may be ready to expire, but we'll give you another one. Ultimately, you can never avoid death. So that won't work either. You will never avoid death. And I do believe that's a fundamental, if you wanted to look at it so-called psychoanalytically, it's a fundamental drive behind this quest for what is called knowledge. But there's many meanings to the word knowledge. So that's what I think. And as far as just the, the press way of talking about it, the scariness of genetic engineering, it is scary. It is more scary than you can even know that it is scary. Viruses can be, they may have been already, can be um, con, uh, let go uh, accidentally or carried or new diseases can, I mean, it's like this. This one thing is true about this world. We may not know a lot. It's a metaphysical world. We don't know why we're here. We don't know where we're going, so to speak. But there's one thing. It's a physical universe. The manifestations are physical. And a physical universe is just that. It doesn't hold the key but it is the manifestation of reality. And in a physical universe, if you have, analogously, many trucks going down a highway with perfect brakes, checked out engineering, excellent drivers, uh, good roads, great weather conditions, and, and dangerous cargo like liquid nitrogen gas or, or plutonium, it is guaranteed that in reality, in a physical universe, one of those trucks, one of those drivers, one of those weather patterns, one of those roads is going to have an accident. This is just reality. And not only will it have an accident, that one we could tell. This will be an accident. We have no idea what it will be. And we don't even know if there have been accidents. It's a physical world. We saw in court cases we watch how the collection of evidence, it's a physical world. You, no matter how much you protect yourself and, and, and touch things, things have to end up somewhere. 
you have to breathe them, you have to touch them, you have to walk on them, no matter how many layers you use to protect them, and then those layers are still uh, stored somewhere. Remember the Ebola virus. They couldn't go near the people. They had to, they had to practice staying far away and getting rid of every possible uh, scintilla of, of anything that had to do with Ebola, and they don't know where it came from. There are many interpretations and, and theories on where AIDS came from. This is not necessarily known as hard fact. So it's very dangerous. And I'll say again, I can't say it enough, why clone? Why hurt animals? Why hurt humans? Why put monkeys into space? Why dig in brains? Why dig into tissue? Why study blood? Why do this? When the, the most amazing task before us is to become better human beings, more civil, more moral, more human, more relating, more brotherly. Fassbinder, the great filmmaker, said, I'm looking for a moral language. And I'm not talking goody, goody, go to church, read the Bible. I'm talking truly having the discipline of your mind to see things as they are and fight with those reactions and negative and biased feelings that you have and to reach out and to relate to your human beings and to, and to study yourself to be something better, less beastly, Get rid of the beast. We all have the beast within. Now, the history of psychology is a long one. It comes out of philosophy. And personally, I feel more of a philosopher uh, beyond anything. The history starts, I mean, um, people may go back to Aristotle. I don't know if there's anyone even previous to him, but they go back to Greek philosophers to, to uh, portray the history of psychology, which came into being something of its own in the 1800s. And it came into being on two basic fronts. One, the experimental front, where people were thinking of your sensation and perception and judgments and thought patterns and reaction times and things like that, the intricacies of the science of who you are. And on the other side, it came with who, who I mentioned before, Sigmund Freud, talking about uh, your inner life and your complexes and your denials, your hidden parts, your denied parts, and uh, the truth of what you really are versus how you have to comport yourself or show yourself to society. And you know today, it is still with us, that how we show ourselves and how we may really be could be two different things altogether. And sometimes we are even very ashamed of how we really are as opposed to how people think of us. Now, <clears throat> in the respect of um, the history of psychology, there's, there's many terms, many basic words uh, that we could talk about to, to sort of lay a foundation of what this psychology is all about. Not the psychology so much of psychopath, psychopathology, uh, or of what we call clinical manifestations or abnormality, but the psychology of just who we are in every way, shape, or form mostly when we're just acting as what we really are, relatively normal human beings, everyday human beings, who, I must say, have to very much be congratulated as I think of that question about working to, in spite of all our imperfections and shames and guilt and denials and complexes and irregularities, do most of us get up every day, do what we have to do, run the rat race, take, the, take on the load, and put up with it. It may not make our mood very good or our disposition good, but it is quite amazing to see what people do put themselves through and manage to handle in a lifespan. It is pretty amazing, and how they keep on going. 
And you know a lot of times you keep on going thinking how no one cares, what is it all worth because nobody cares, and that's just the nature of our psychology, that we live in reference to each other. We live even if we're strangers and we're all alone, we live watching television, what's on television, people. We live with them in our lives, mentally or truly. We look at people, we, we dress like them, or we act like them, or we act opposite them. We're always bouncing off references. We're a gregarious uh, species. We live in reference to each other. And when we don't have the connection, we feel very desolate indeed. And with respect to um, um, people feeling desolate and, 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 and desolate and, and, and um, alone and what is it all worth, um, I would like to point out too that our children often um, you know, act strangely and negatively because they don't have this sense of love connection even when you may feel you're doing well by your children um, look a little closer, step back, and look a little closer because uh, they may not be kidding when they say or, or act as though they can't feel that caring or that love connection. Now, in res in, with respect to um, coming towards a conclusion, I'd like to thank the crew who went through great lengths, I assure you, to be here this evening. And it's very warm in our studio this evening. And we're putting up with this. We also work all day, and people are nice enough to come out here and help run this show. And um, I'm very appreciate, appreciative of that. I, I want to thank, thank Jasmine, who gave us the questions. And um, I want to thank the people who called. And I hope you continue to watch. I also want um, to mention, as I always do, please go outside. The weather's turning nicer now. You have more incentive. But it's part of this being aware. Um, it'll make you feel better. Know what's going on with your environment. And um, how many minutes have we to go? You're telling me. OK. Six minutes? OK. And secondly, they're telling me we're, we're coming down to time. I think we should have some times, but anyway. Uh, please be with us on the 13th of March and the 27th here on a Thursday at 7 p.m. And be ready with your questions. And please keep the animals out of the laboratory. And please be a model to our children. I'm going to sing a song now for the youth. It's called Youth Movement. <clears throat> And it's specifically to um, the teenagers, pretty much, and um, asking them to pick up where they may feel they don't have the connection and um, do what they have to do as best they can. Oh, and I will need the volume. Just We had shut the volume off. In so I had to turn it on. OK. Then I am waiting to hear it. whose mouth is the fastest. It's so old-fashioned to be laughing lastest. <laughs> Conquering males of sexual prowess accomplished by the female meowest. Subjugated female, male identity. Wake up woman, self-integrity. It's a youth movement. The movement is 
is you 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 use movement the movement is you 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 use movement the movement is you 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 use movement the movement is you 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 movement the movement is you 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 use movement the movement is you 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 use movement even when you act like you're turning him down your whole frame of reference is the male around town don't mistake passion for something like a privilege it's far for the course it's the natural human beauty it's a youth movement the movement is you 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 youth movement the movement is you roxbury youth movement the movement is you madapan movement the movement is you yeah cambridge movement the movement is you yeah chelsea movement BS may have spoken for the Grandmaster Flash. Money is the only thing to save your chance. BS may have spoken for the treacherous three. Money is the way you get to get to get to be. Glue yourself to sport. Support them with your dough. You'll be getting fatter as you sit on your toe. You want to project in the world it's a whole. Knowing more than what you know is excellent gold. Sniffing and a searching, learning all kinds of things. How to plant a garden, how the telephone rings. What is statistics? Can you judge if it's true? Can you be aware? of what might happen to you? What about the art of law and deadly radiation? It takes a lifetime to get an education. The zoodles around you. You got a good chance to be a victim of your own ignorance. You're going to blame your chance on your circumstance? Science may hinder, science may hurt. How does one know unless to science alert? With a nose to the board and a feet to the axe, broaden your effort to swing with a mass. Get up, get on, get read and read and write. If it don't come easy, add some extra to your might. It should be hard, what on earth you think this is? A man-made cage for 20th century guinea pigs? You're only a youth for a year or two, then you're an adult. What on earth you gonna do? Adults control you, they throw the buck to you. You pass it, now you pass your lifehood too, it's you. It's up to you. You. Youth movement, yeah, it's you. Youth, youth movement, the movement is you, 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 youth, youth movement, the movement is you, 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 youth, youth movement, the movement is you, yeah, move. United States, move. Thank you. This concludes our show. Hope to see you two weeks, 7 o'clock Thursday. Cosmic powwow, cosmic powwow, cosmic powwow, cosmic powwow.